Hello friends, welcome to another video. This time I'm going to tell you the story of Gregory Bridgerton, based on the book On the Way to the Wedding, by Julia Quinn. Without further ado, let's get started. Hurrying through the streets of London, oblivious to the accusing stares of passers-by, Gregory Bridgerton raced towards the church. He had to stop the wedding. She had decided to go through with it, even though she knew his feelings perfectly well, and reciprocated them. When he finally made it to the church, he shouted out that he loved her, with what little breath he had left, but no one said anything. "'Don't marry him,' he insisted. "'Gregory,' she whispered, "'why are you doing this?' "'I love you,' he replied. She looked at the man standing in front of her at the altar, who only shrugged his shoulders. Gregory, in desperation, dropped to one knee on the floor. "'Marry me,' he said, his very soul in his words, "'marry me.' Her lips trembled, but her voice was very clear when she said, "'Gregory was a hopeless romantic. He believed in true love and dreamed of finding it. Surrounded by his brothers, all of whom were happily married, it was impossible not to believe in it. However, he had no ideal woman in sight. He didn't really care about looks, although he liked the idea of her being intelligent. That day, he had arrived at the Bridgerton house where his older brother Anthony and sister-in-law Kate lived. His brother had taken it upon himself to give him a talk about the future, insisting that since he was 26, he should think about settling down. That evening, his sister-in-law had arranged a party to be attended by a number of unmarried ladies who would also be spending a few days at the Bridgerton's country house. Anthony said goodbye to his brother and went down to the ballroom in search of Kate, but it was at that moment that he saw her, or well, saw the back of her neck, and a small lock of blonde hair resting on her shoulder, and thought he was ruined. He approached her slowly, ignoring everything else, but it was another girl, the one she was talking to, who looked at him first. Lucinda Abernathy, or as everyone knew her, Lucy, was Hermione Watson's best friend, and she had been used to scenes like that for a long time, as her friend used to make every man fall in love with her. Hermione was beautiful, with light blonde hair, a heart-shaped face, and beautiful green eyes. Lucy, on the other hand, was a little less than Hermione, a little less blonde, a little less slim, a little less tall, her eyes were a grayish blue, but in no way comparable to her friends. They had met at the girls' school where they studied together for three years. The fact that Hermione was more beautiful than her had never been an impediment to their friendship. In fact, Lucy had an advantage in that she was an excellent dancer, and her friend, on the other hand, did not know how to dance. After a silent pause in which Gregory did something incredible, he took Lucy's hand and kissed it first. This impressed the girl, for no doubt this would get her friend's attention more, and she thought that Gregory would have had a chance with Hermione if she wasn't already in love. No man who approached her friend had ever even looked at her, not that she expected it or cared, since she was practically engaged to Lord Hazelby. When Gregory asked Hermione to dance, she excused herself by pretending to have a sprained ankle, so he ended up asking Lucy, although for some reason they ended up at the dinner table. As Gregory gobbled down a couple of sandwiches, Lucy made it clear to him that his attempts with Hermione were in vain since she was in love, which discouraged Gregory, although he decided not to give up. After saying goodbye to him, Lucy retired to the room she shared in the same house with Hermione. There she found the girl reading a letter sent by Mr. Edmonds. Lucy knew that her friend was truly in love with this man, but it was also a fact that this love was impossible. Edmonds was the secretary of Hermione's father, who was the only daughter of a Viscount, which meant that such a union would never be approved. Lucy reminded her friend of this fact constantly, and even insisted that she try to fall in love with a man more suited to her. Hermione told her that you couldn't choose who you should fall in love with. It just happened. Lucy, however, disagreed with this. Hermione had fallen in love with Edmonds just by looking at the back of his neck and his extremely blonde hair. She thought she was listening to music from somewhere far away, and from that moment on, she was ruined. Lucy reminded Hermione that Gregory was interested in her, and that he might be a good match as he came from a respectable family. This annoyed her friend, who replied that if she was so interested, she could win him over. Clearly, Lucy could not, as she was 
practically engaged to Lord Hazelby. Lucy had been betrothed to this man on the word of her uncle, who had negotiated her marriage to Hazelby's father years before. The man was ten years older than she was, so all they were waiting for was for her to grow up and be of a decent age to marry, which had already happened, so the wedding was likely to be close. Besides, Hazelby was a good match, spoke well to her, and looked decent. But it must also be remembered that her uncle had been the guardian of Lucy and her brother Richard since their father's death ten years earlier, and she felt it her duty to obey him out of gratitude. The next morning, the guests at the ball went out on the town. All the women were accompanied by a gentleman, so Gregory asked Kate to pair him with Hermione. And despite the disappointment of his sister-in-law, who had actually intended to pair him with Lucy, he went out arm in arm with Hermione. Along the way, Gregory tried, in vain, to make conversation with the girl. Lucy thought his efforts to win her friend over were exaggerated. She told him to stop looking so devoted and in love and to start ignoring Hermione. Only this way, he could get her attention. Gregory reluctantly accepted the advice, and the next day, he stayed away from them, staying on the other side of the ballroom, although this did not work. Annoyed, he intercepted Lucy on her way to the powder rooms, pulling her into the library, and demanded her bad advice. The girl apologized, telling him that she sincerely hoped it would work, but that he shouldn't give up anyway. Hermione would have to give up the idea of marrying Edmund sooner or later. He looked at Lucy and told her that if Hermione was really in love with Edmund, he would risk everything. Lucy gasped, but couldn't help but ask him if he would, and he said yes, he would risk everything. He then returned the question and she caught herself hesitating. Days ago, she would have said no, that she was too practical for something so silly, and that that kind of love did not exist, but something had changed inside her. So she answered with, it depends. It depends on love and how it feels. He didn't seem to understand, asked her if she thought love felt different for each person, and told her that when she fell in love, she would certainly realize it and feel as if that person meant everything to her. Lucy didn't understand why she seemed to be the only one unable to see love as others did. But in that moment, unable to take her eyes off Gregory, she felt strange, different, Lucy then told him that this was how Hermione had described it, how she had said she had felt when she first saw Edmund. That bothered him, but when he looked into Lucy's eyes, he realized that something wasn't right. Her eyes made him uneasy. He had the feeling that he knew what she was about to tell him, but that couldn't happen. What did she say? He asked, referring to Hermione. She said she saw the back of his head, Lucy replied. She heard music, and then all she could think was... I'm ruined. This hit Gregory like a slap in the face. It was exactly what he had felt when he saw her. Despite this, Lucy insisted that he should not give up, for Hermione would eventually accept that he was a good match. He was better than the rest. However, as she continued talking, he couldn't take his eyes off her, her graceful movements, her gray eyes, her lips, and the way they moved, and he wondered what it would feel like to kiss them. We must go back he said, convincing himself that his thoughts were only the product of frustration and despair. Lucy woke up the next day, chastising herself for having told Gregory that he was better than the others, which was practically a declaration of love. Moreover, she was beginning to feel strange when she remembered Gregory, though she refused to think that she was possibly falling in love. She felt so ashamed of what had happened the night before that she decided not to go down for breakfast, so she told Hermione that her stomach hurt, which was obviously a lie. Her friend then went alone down to the dining room where she met Gregory, who jumped at the chance to strike up a conversation with her. And the strategy worked so well that when she returned to the room, the girl confessed to her friend that she was confused. Hermione told Lucy how that brief conversation with Gregory had made her feel something inside, something that couldn't compare to what she felt for Mr. Edmonds but it had made her feel something inside. Later, they received an unexpected visitor. Lucy's older brother Richard arrived at Bridgerton House with an errand. Their uncle had decided to set a date for Lucy and Hazelby's wedding. Although the girl had accepted that this would happen, the knowledge that it was closer than ever made her cringe at the idea of marriage. She wanted more time for herself, to feel free, to be happy, and suddenly, 
she imagined herself dancing in a huge ballroom in Gregory's arms. After being comforted by Richard, Lucy decided to sit alone in the garden of the house. After a few minutes, Gregory appeared on the scene. He knew her well enough by now to notice that she wasn't being herself, but he didn't dare ask the reason for her absent attitude. He had gone for a walk with Hermione, and his attempts to win her over were paying off. Grigori decided to mention this achievement to Lucy, as well as the fact that he had noticed that her brother Richard was more in love with the beautiful girl. This upset Lucy, who refused to believe it, as he was only 22 years old and too young to marry. After this, they decided to return to the house. Kate had organized a masquerade party for the next day, and as she arrived at the ballroom with her mask on, she was met by Lucy, who seemed to have no trouble recognizing it. On a sudden impulse, he decided to ask her to dance, and together they walked around the dance floor to the music as they laughed. She was undoubtedly an excellent dancer, and he let her know it, accepting also how elegant she was, even more so than Hermione. However, the bubble of enchantment was burst when Lucy told him that her friend and brother had gone out into the garden to get some air. Gregory, aware that Richard was as infatuated with Hermione as he was, knew at once that their courtship was in danger, so he told Lucy that they must find them, though she was still convinced that her brother was not in love with her best friend. That's why she thought of getting Kate to help her look for the two boys. As soon as Kate was aware of the situation, she knew they had to find them immediately. Lucy continued to insist that her brother was not in love with Hermione, and that he would not be able to dishonor her best friend either, but Kate agreed with Gregory, and Lucy had no choice but to accept that she had been wrong. The three of them set off and started looking for them. Suddenly, Lucy had a revelation, and knew immediately where to find them. She ran to the orange grove, a place full of beautiful flowers. Gregory followed soon after, worried for her safety. When they entered the place, their suspicions were confirmed. Gregory and Richard began to wrestle, rolling around on the floor, while Hermione leaned into Lucy's arms and asked her what had happened. The girl, with a sob, replied, Oh, Lucy, I fluttered. An hour later, Richard and Hermione were engaged to be married. Lucy was back at the ball, and Gregory was trying hard to stay drunk. Though he wasn't sure how he felt, how was he supposed to feel if he'd just walked out on a woman who'd left him breathless with another gentleman? Definitely not how he felt. He could tell he even felt exhilarated by the fact that he had hit Richard. Lucy, for her part, had slipped out of the party as soon as she had the chance. Walking blindly down a dark corridor on her way to her room, she bumped into someone, who turned out to be, of course, Gregory. He was obviously drunk, and he seemed... happy. Happy? After all that had happened that night. She, however, felt the urge to vent to him, how she had felt about discovering her brother and best friend. Gregory, hypnotized, gradually drew closer to her, and in the darkness of that deserted hallway, he kissed her, and she let herself be carried away, ran her hands through his hair, and he drew her closer to his post, imbuing her with his warmth and desire. But then, she remembered that she was engaged. She was no longer almost engaged. Her uncle had signed the papers. She was getting married. She had to get married. She pushed him away, whispering that she could not do it, and that she must go. He did not object, but insisted on escorting her to her room, refusing to let her go alone. The next morning, Gregory met Kate at breakfast, and after a brief conversation in which Kate informed him that Lucy and Richard would be leaving later that day, he jumped up and went out to look for her. Meanwhile, the two friends were talking in their room. Hermione apologized to Lucy for what had happened the night before. She told her that she thought she loved Mr. Edmonds, but that day when she had enjoyed Gregory's company while they were having breakfast, she had felt as if she had woken up from a dream, and this made her wonder if she was really in love with Edmonds. Then with Richard, she had felt as if she had come home. With him, she felt comfortable and confident. Lucy was confused and annoyed. She didn't understand why after everyone described love as a wild and scorching feeling, now her best friend was defining it as something comfortable. However, Lucy had to admit that the kiss with Gregory had made her feel all that and more. She had listened to music while she kissed him, and she had felt like she was floating and trembling, 
everything that Hermione had told her she had felt with Mr. Edmonds, and everything she had just told her she felt with Richard, all of that with just one person, she was hopelessly in love with Gregory Bridgerton. Gregory found Lucy sitting in the garden of the house, a few minutes away from leaving. He decided it would be best to apologize for what had happened the night before, and she accepted his apology without making a big deal of it, although she looked sad and tired. He then told her that he would see her in London, to which she replied that this would not be possible as she was engaged. Practically engaged, he reminded her, and she shook her head. He then explained that her uncle had made the arrangement, and that she would soon be married. He then told her that he was sorry that things hadn't turned out as he had hoped. Not me, he thought. He couldn't imagine a life with Hermione anymore. He simply couldn't. It would be a boring life. Lucy then said goodbye with the excuse of going for a walk in the garden, and so she left him without looking back. One month later, Lucy had spent the last 30 days cooped up in her uncle's house in London, waiting for her wedding day and watching out the window at social events, looking to see Gregory, but he hadn't shown up on any occasion. She remembered not glimpsing any kind of feeling when she told him about her engagement, just a little surprise, so she avoided fooling herself into thinking he reciprocated her feelings. Gregory had returned to the city after a month in the country, and the first person he had seen was Lucy Abernathy. He had to confess that he could not stop thinking about that kiss. She saw him, watching her from afar, and Gregory had no choice but to come over and sit beside her feeding pigeons. She told him she was in London for her wedding, which was to take place in a week. He, for his part, confessed that he no longer felt in love with Hermione. They exchanged a few more words, and Gregory learned that Hasselby would be Lucy's future husband, which caused him some surprise, although Lucy did not understand why, then invited her to a ball that her sister Daphne would give the next day, promising that her mother, Violet, would convince her uncle to let her go, as he refused to let her leave the house until she was married. Later, Gregory went to his mother's house to ask her to intervene with Lucy's uncle. She was, of course, delighted to help him, as her youngest son was usually very independent and hardly ever asked for anyone's help. The next day, his mother informed him that Lucy was going to the party. This cheered Gregory, who remembered the girl's sad and conformed expression as she told him she could not go. The fact was that Gregory did not relish the idea of Lucy marrying someone else, but he had to admit that Hasselby was a good catch. He was an earl. He had money and property. He had known him well enough to know that he would treat her well, give her a good allowance and never mistreat her, and that was more than many of the women in London get. However, there was one small thing about him. He didn't like women. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but it would limit Lucy's life a lot, and Gregory didn't think she deserved that. Lucy was a free and determined woman. She deserved to have a big house, full of flowers, dogs, cats, and children, at least eight children. That evening, at his elder sister's house, Gregory found himself at the ball with Hyacinth and her mother. Both of them questioned him about Lucy and his determination to invite her to the party, though he tried to play it down by saying that she was engaged and would be married in a week. When he was finally free of them, he began to walk around the room, greeting the guests, and it was at that moment that he saw her. Her back was turned, she was blonde and slender, and Gregory's world was turned upside down. It was like when he saw the back of Hermione's neck that first time. No, actually, it was better. Hermione's had been like experiencing falling in love for the first time. This was safer, stronger. He approached the mysterious woman, unable to contain himself, waiting desperately to see her face. And when he finally turned around, he discovered what he least expected. It was Lucinda Abernathy. He saw her, and she saw him, and smiled at him. And when he greeted her, saying her name, he was certain that he loved her. He was in love with Lucy Abernathy. They danced together while smiling, exchanging glances and brushing hands. When they finished, Gregory asked her to meet him in the bathroom. Lucy wanted to refuse, but she was very curious about what he wanted to tell her. Maybe he loved her. Maybe he had fallen in love with her and wanted her to marry him. There was still a week before their wedding. There was still time. 
she yielded to his proposal, though fearful of unleashing a scandal. However, their discussion was interrupted when Hayseth made his presence known, and with just a glance from Lucy to Gregory and from Gregory to Lucy, she knew what they both intended. She then took over and ordered Gregory to continue dancing and talking to the people while she introduced Lucy to the guests. After 55 minutes, she tore the girl's dress and retired with her to Daphne's room, where Gregory would be waiting for them. On arriving, they found the place empty, so Hasynth took the opportunity to sew up the tear in Lucy's dress. As she did so, the girl asked why she was helping her if she knew she was engaged. Hasynth confirmed that she was aware of it, and in fact informed her that she had been invited. Lucy then asked if she planned to attend, to which Hyacinth replied, And you? Gregory appeared on the scene, and Hasynth announced that he would stay nearby in case she was needed. He then told her that he could not marry her, but instead of telling her that he wanted to be the one to walk her down the aisle because he loved her, he decided to tell her that he could not marry her because she was his friend and he wanted her to be happy, and she would not be happy if she married Hasselby because he did not like women. Lucy finally exploded. She asked him why he had done it, why he had decided to tell her the truth. Was he doing it to make her feel the way he felt about Hermione and Richard's wedding? Did he want to see her as miserable as he was? Then she asked him why he had made her love him. He took her face in his arms and kissed her, then begged her not to marry him. You can't marry him, he said, taking her by the arms. I love you. Really? she asked. With all my heart, he confirmed. It's just that I didn't realize. I'm a fool, a blind man. Don't hurt yourself, she said. No one notices me when Hermione is around. She's not even close to your feet, he replied, and assured her that he loved her so much that he would do anything to prevent her from marrying someone else. She, feeling bold, promised that she would talk to her uncle the next day and break off her engagement. He then asked if he could go with her and communicate his intentions, to which she asked, and what are your intentions? He looked at her with surprise, then with approval, he let his hands slide down her body as he descended, dropped to one knee on the floor and asked her, Lady Lucinda Abernathy, will you grant me the great acquaintance of becoming my wife? Marry me, Lucy. She, shocked, answered yes. The next day, Lucy found herself in her uncle's office, trying very hard to reveal herself for the first time. She told him that she did not want to marry Hasselby because she did not like women. The man laughed, confirming with this gesture that he was aware of this information and did not see the problem, so she insisted that she wanted to have children. He then told her that Hasselby's preferences would not be an impediment, as he was sure he could do his job often enough to father a child, and if he could not, he would be her father. This chilled Lucy, and she flatly refused to marry Hasselby. This infuriated her uncle, who knew from her expression that something physical had happened between her and Gregory. Hasselby won't be able to tell the difference between a virgin and a prostitute anyway, he said dismissively. Then he informed her that she would be locked up in that house until the wedding day. In desperation, she asked him why she should marry Hasselby if they did not need his money or his position, why she could not simply marry for love. Her uncle grabbed her by the throat slamming her against the wall, then told her that they owed Hasselby's father a debt and that she was the payment to settle it. Her father had committed treason, and the proof of it was in the hands of the man who had blackmailed the family for years. Her father had sold state secrets to the French. If she did not marry, and the king learned of her father's treachery, all would be stripped from him, not from her, but from Richard, who now held the family title. Lucy knew then that she had to get married because if she didn't, she would condemn her brother and Hermione to a life of misery and shame. It was worth the sacrifice. The next few days, she devoted herself to refusing Gregory's visits, who insistently came to her door every evening. Gregory was desperate. He had tried to see Lucy, but she had refused him. Was she being held against her will? He decided then that he would break into the house. He slipped through the service door, walked through the corridors of the house, calculating the location of his room, and on entering was attacked by Lucy herself, wielding a candlestick. After a brief moment of shock, she asked him to leave, but he told her he would not go, that he loved her, 
and repeated this several times and begged her to marry him, saying she would not be happy. I will be satisfied, she replied, though she knew she would never again feel what Gregory made her feel, nor would she ever feel loved or desired. So, she did what she never thought she was capable of doing. She let herself be carried away by desire. She asked Gregory to kiss her, and then they made love and slept together until dawn. Gregory asked her to go with him, but she told him she could not just walk away and leave Hasselby standing at the altar, so he said he would wait for her outside until she settled the matter. However, once he was outside, he thought that if Lucy needed him to intervene, she would need all the help she could get, so he thought of his brothers and asked for their support for the first time in his 26 years. He sent for Colin, who turned up a few hours later. After a few more hours, they saw a carriage decorated in white, then out of the house came Richard and Hermione arm in arm, Lucy's uncle, and, to Gregory's dismay, Lucy herself. He was walking along of his own accord, and when Colin asked him if she had told him she would not marry, Gregory had a very unpleasant revelation. Lucy had told him that she loved him, that she must do what was right, but she had never told him that she would not marry Hasselby. Colin, who looked at him with regret, said he was sorry, but Gregory refused to believe that she wanted to marry Hasselby, so when she started for the church in her carriage, he ran off without a second thought. Meanwhile, Lucy was fighting against herself as she waited for the moment when she would have to walk down the aisle. She had opted not to tell Hermione anything, knowing that it would prompt her to drop everything and leave with Gregory, but her friend seemed to suspect that something wasn't right. Once he stood at the altar, said his yes and pronounced his vows, something unexpected happened. Gregory appeared on the scene, threw open the doors, and breathing heavily, shouted, No! She looked at him, stunned, and he, in front of hundreds of people, told her that he loved her. He knelt down in front of her and asked her to marry him, and she found herself wanting to say yes, to shout that she loved him, but instead, she gathered all her strength, and with a firm and determined voice, she answered, no. And then all hell broke loose. Yes, in the church. Hasselby's father leapt forward and threw himself on top of Gregory, who was struggling to get to her, and Hasselby grabbed Lucy's arm and pulled her away, shielding her from the chaos. When Gregory finally broke free, he crawled over to her, struggling against the strength of Colin's arms, and looked up at her with glassy, pleading eyes. Why? he asked. Because I must, she replied. Gregory was then dragged out of the church as Hyacinth appeared behind Lucy, glaring angrily at her. How could you? she reproached her. You wouldn't understand, Lucy replied, to which Hyacinth replied that she didn't deserve her brother and left in the company of her mother. At this point, the wedding resumed its course, and against all odds, Lucy was married. Colin had arranged for his younger brother to be put into a carriage which Violet and Hyacinth also boarded. The latter, furious, vowed to make Lucy's life miserable until Gregory himself silenced her by forbidding her to do anything. He kept thinking that Lucy had been forced to marry, but what had she done? What was she being blackmailed with? After thinking about it for a long time, he thought that Lucy had definitely been forced. Something serious was going on something much bigger than her, and she was going to need his help. When Lucy was able to escape from the party, she returned to her room where, to her surprise, Gregory was waiting for her. The boy asked her why she had married, what was going on, but she would not answer that question, so he asked her if she loved him, and she, unable to help herself, answered yes. Gregory then thought that there must be some way to fix the situation, and remembered that Lucy had not consummated the marriage, so there was a possibility of annulling it. He then told her that she had to leave with him, and when she refused, he grabbed her by the waist, threw her over his shoulder, and ran out of the room. He took her to a bathroom on the third floor of the huge house and tied her up with a pair of handkerchiefs. Lucy then told him about the blackmail, her father's betrayal, and the debt she had to pay. Now he understood everything and knew he had to get away from her, but he asked her to give him an hour to find a solution. Gregory returned to Lucy's room, and on the way he ran into Hermione, whom he asked for help, knowing that she was the only person who would care about Lucy's happiness even more than her own. A few minutes later, 
Gregory found himself in front of Richard, Hermione, and Hasselby himself, who agreed to annul the marriage. But when Gregory asked him what he would do with their family secret, he denied any knowledge of it. Gregory then told the three of them what Lucy had told him, and Richard refused to believe that his father had done this, even when Hasselby's father swore he had written proof. They concluded that Lucy's uncle had tricked her into marrying Hasselby and paying off another kind of debt that had nothing to do with her father. They then decided to look for Hasselby's father to clarify the situation, while Gregory and Hermione looked for Lucy to take her with them. But when they arrived at the bathroom where the boy had left her tied up, they couldn't find her. A few minutes earlier, Lucy had been discovered by her uncle, who, with a knife, had cut her restraints and dragged her out of the bathroom, claiming that he would see to it that she consummated her marriage right then and there. He took her to his room and blindfolded her, then began to point a gun at her. It was at that moment that Gregory appeared. He pointed a gun at Lucy's uncle that Richard had given him minutes before and demanded that he tell him the real reason why he wanted Lucy to marry Hasselby. And it was at that moment that they discovered that the real traitor was him. Robert Abernathy had committed treason against England, not Lucy's father. Gregory then gave him a chance to escape if he would leave Lucy alone, but he refused to leave, and the opportunity vanished when Richard, Hermione, Hasselby, and his father appeared at the door. Cornered, he began to point his gun at everyone present. Then a shot rang out and Gregory instinctively fired, hitting the man in the shoulder, and he fell on top of Lucy. Gregory ran to her, examining her, looking for injuries, but the girl was unharmed. Finally, Hasselby agreed to annul the marriage the next day. Gregory forced Hasselby's father to stop blackmailing Lucy's uncle and get him out of the country, and Lucy undertook to help Hasselby get a new wife. And then, when Gregory had made sure that everything was in order, he took Lucy's face in his hands and kissed her. Then, oblivious to the number of witnesses watching and Richard's voice clearing over the wedding preparations, he pressed the tip of his nose to hers and told her that he loved her. Gregory Bridgerton, in short, was a hopeless romantic. A few years later, Gregory found himself sitting in the doorway of the delivery room not two, not three times, but seven times. Yes, they had had eight children. Luckily, she had received a fairly generous dowry, and Gregory had discovered her talent and eye for business so they had enough money to support the large family. When Lucy announced that she was expecting her last and eighth child, Gregory decided that he wanted to be by her side during the birth and not outside as he was used to. He was amazed at how quickly it all went and how easily Lucy took it all in and assured him that it had become easier with time. However, when the baby came into the world, Lucy sensed that something was wrong. It was at that moment that the midwife announced that another baby was coming. It was twins. Gregory had to sit down and take a deep breath. He had nine children, nine. Love existed, he thought to himself, as he looked at his beautiful wife. And it was great, nine times great. Second epilogue. What I will now narrate is the second epilogue or ending of this story, which has been published in the ninth book of the saga, Bridgerton's Happily Ever After. So the author decided to write this second ending right where the previous book left off, at Lucy's last birth. Hyacinth had traveled to her brother's house to help her sister-in-law through the last months of her pregnancy. Lucy seemed to be coping quite well with the pregnancy, but Lucy had complained of feeling different in that belly, and her suspicions were confirmed the moment she gave birth to twins. Hacinth had found it hard to forgive Lucy after what she had done to her brother, so he did not speak to her for the first two years she was in the family. Gregory and Lucy had managed to get married thanks to the influence of Anthony, Hasselby, and a good sum of money, I mean donation, that they had made to the church. After those first two years, Hyacinth and Lucy had managed to form quite a close sisterhood. That day, as they held the two babies in their arms, they discussed what they would name them, their other children had been named after their siblings, Richard, Anthony, Hermione, Daphne, Benedict, Colin, and even Kate, who had played an important role in their relationship. So now, if they followed the order, the two girls were to be named Eloise and Francesca. 
This outraged Hyacinth, as she would be the only one not to have a namesake in her brother's large family group, which Gregory used to taunt her that this was because she had attacked Lucy in church. As the brothers continued to argue, they noticed Lucy's face fading to pale and ashen, and called the midwife who confirmed that Lucy was hemorrhaging. After several minutes of work, the woman announced that there was nothing more they could do for her, only wait for her to recover. Lucy had been unconscious and remained so for two days. Catherine, her eldest daughter, who was the most like her in character of all her children, had come to visit her, unaware of her frail health, which Gregory had decided not to tell the children. The girl had told her father that her mother was the best and that one of the babies should be named after her. So they named them Francesca Hyacinth and Eloise Lucy. To Gregory's relief, who had been in a state of sadness at the thought of losing his wife, Lucy regained consciousness. She was still quite weak, and the doctor had informed Gregory that it would be months before she could fully recover, and that she would have to be on bed rest for at least a month. He knew it would be a challenge to force Lucy to comply, so he threatened to tie her down so she wouldn't get up, reminding her that it wouldn't be the first time he had done that. This brought a smile to Lucy's face and she asked to see her children. Gregory went in search of the seven children, who, in order of age, entered the room and threw themselves into their mother's arms, giving her back the vitality she so desperately needed. If you like this kind of video, let me know in the comments, and by subscribing to this channel, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll hear from you next time.